Most college administrators have spent the last few months focused on planning how best to resume classes in the fall against the backdrop of a seemingly ever-changing global pandemic, and media coverage has reflected this focus. However, another time-sensitive project has been occupying the minds of legal counsel and Title IX offices on campuses across the nation, sweeping changes to Title IX regulations, which campuses must implement even as they deal with the pandemic. In May 2020, the U.S. Department of Education released an exhaustive set of new Title IX regulations which, along with the over 2,000 pages of explanatory guidance, have dramatically changed the way that schools, both K-12 and higher education, are required to respond to complaints of sexual misconduct within their educational programs and activities. Schools have been forced to overhaul policies and enact new processes to maintain compliance with this federal law, and the U.S. Department of Education has mandated that all schools be in full compliance with these new regulations by August 14th, meaning that schools that are already facing financial cuts, furloughs, and staffing challenges must reallocate precious resources away from pandemic-related academic and safety planning in order to comply with what many in the Title IX field view as an inappropriately timed, controversial step back from Obama-era protections for victims of sexual misconduct and non-discrimination policies protecting transgendered individuals on college campuses. Enacted as part of the Federal Education Amendments Act of 1972, Title IX is most well known as the federal law that requires schools to take measures to ensure gender-based equality in athletics programs. However, over the past decade, the primary focus of Title IX has increasingly shifted to the prevention and adjudication of complaints involving sexual misconduct. During the Obama administration, the Department of Education issued a number of Dear Colleague letters, providing schools with guidance on how to handle complaints of sexual misconduct, most of which were widely seen as increasing protections for victims. In addition to removing some local institutional control over the handling of these complaints, these Dear Colleague letters also received a fair amount of criticism, as many viewed the actions of the department as evidence of governmental overreach that served to limit free speech rights and also unfairly violated the due process rights of those alleged to have committed sexual misconduct. In many ways, the new regulations are a direct response to these criticisms. They were created using an extensive rulemaking process that included the opportunity for public comments and the resulting 2,000 pages of explanatory guidance written by the department focuses extensively on the value of protecting the constitutional rights of all parties throughout the Title IX process. Why are the new Title IX regulations controversial? Well, the first and possibly most controversial element of the new Title IX regulations centers around the requirement that colleges hold live hearings that allow for cross-examination of witnesses and other parties to a complaint, largely seen as a requirement that can unduly traumatize, re-victimize, and discourage reporting by victims. There are also serious concerns about whether cross-examination will accomplish the goal it's purported to serve a more reliable process that protects the rights of the accused by creating an opportunity for the accused to actively participate in the investigation process. That said, the process does provide all parties with a clearly articulated right to examine relevant evidence during the investigation process, as well as in preparation for and during the hearing itself. Although there are many procedural requirements for the hearing and cross-examination process, of particular significance to this discussion is the fact that the decision maker is forbidden under the regulations to consider any statements of a witness or a party if that witness or party refuses to participate in cross-examination. Although the new regulations provide additional procedural protections, such as the right to cross-examination, they also limit the application of Title IX by imposing some relatively significant restrictions around when Title IX actually applies to a complaint. In cases where any of the following jurisdictional requirements are not met, a school is required to dismiss the complaint for purposes of Title IX. And although the, although the school does have the discretion to continue the investigation under another policy or process, it's absolutely required to dismiss the complaint for purposes of Title IX. So what are those requirements? First, 
The reported conduct must include a sexual crime, as defined under the Violence Against Women Act. Yes, a very poorly named statute, because of course sex crimes can be and are perpetrated against individuals regardless of sex or gender. These crimes include sexual assault, dating or domestic violence, and stalking, or it must include certain severe forms of sexual harassment, including quid pro quo sexual harassment and or hostile work or education environment sexual harassment. Second, the conduct in the complaint must have occurred in the context of one of the school's education programs or activities. Basically, the school has to have control over both the accused and the event or location where the misconduct occurred. Fraternity and sorority houses count by default. And the victim must be participating or attempting to participate in an education program or activity of the school at the time the report of misconduct is filed with the university. And finally, the misconduct must occur within the United States, meaning that sexual misconduct that occurs during a study abroad program or outside of the United States cannot be handled under a school's Title IX process. As you can imagine, these jurisdictional requirements do significantly limit the extent to which Title IX applies to reports of sexual misconduct. And again, while this does not mean that a school cannot elect to investigate or even adjudicate a complaint of sexual misconduct outside the Title IX policy, under a student or faculty code of conduct or staff handbook, for example, it does limit the situations under which a school is required to provide the various procedural rights and obligations outlined in the new Title IX regulations, including, for instance, the right to cross-examination to the parties. So, with that, here are a few practical tips for administrators who've had trouble keeping up with the requirements of Title IX. First, understand your school's reporting requirements. In the past, many colleges required most, if not all, employees to report any information about sexual misconduct that they become aware of to the Title IX coordinator. However, under the new regulations, colleges have some significant leeway in deciding who is obligated to report. That said, most administrators, that is those with the authority to Institute corrective measures on behalf of the college will be required to report suspected sexual misconduct to the Title IX coordinator. When in doubt, reach out to your Title IX coordinator. Second, if you will be playing an active role in the Title IX process, say as a decision maker or a member of a hearing panel, insist on receiving the training you need to accomplish the task. The new regulations require all employees involved in the Title IX process to undergo training on an annual basis, and the regulations include specific guidelines regard regarding what that training must include. Third, ensure that someone, likely your Title IX office, is keeping appropriate records. One of the best defenses against an allegation of deliberate indifference to a report of sexual misconduct is a good set of records. Schools are required to keep records, including investigation reports and decisions, for seven years. Help your Title IX coordinator and your Title IX team accomplish this by doing your part. Which leads me to my final tip. Utilize your Title IX coordinators. After all, they are the people at your campus with the most familiarity with your school's processes for handling complaints of sexual misconduct. If you're unsure of how to proceed, or whether you have an obligation to take a particular action under the new Title IX regulations, or even under your school's Title IX policy, rest assured that your Title IX coordinator will know, or will know how to find out. I hope this information has been helpful to you. Some of you are just beginning your fall semesters as this video is released. My thoughts are with you. Stay safe and healthy, and I look forward to talking with you again next week.